I want to thank all of you for joining me today. And I want to thank Soka Gagai International for the opportunity to address you. Uh, considering the names, the, the people you've had as a part of this uh, Culture of Peace lecture series, I'm absolutely humbled uh, and, and privileged to have this opportunity. If you haven't had a chance to, to take a look at the, um, the exhibit, this is a wonderful exhibit. And uh, I, I wish I had authored quite a bit of this, because uh, much of what I'm saying is, is probably expressed more eloquently uh, in the exhibit. Uh, over here, the preamble of the UNESCO Constitution declares that since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that defenses of peace must be constructed. And Soka Gakkai International President Daisaku Ikeda eloquently writes that fear builds barriers of aversion and discrimination in the forms of national boundaries or of exclusion and discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender, social class, financial status, or merely of personal preference. This afternoon, I will argue the case for why fear and insecurity compel individuals to commit some of the worst atrocities in human history. I'll introduce empirical evidence suggesting that racism, combined with fear, heighten the level of atrocity and compel even greater killing. I will outline the basic premises of the, of the field of international relations, which is my own field of training, and demonstrate how it reinforces the basic fears which have compelled this human misery. And considering that those who would practice foreign policy are typically trained in my field, will suggest that we are what we teach. And I will conclude with thoughts on how to overcome these problems posed by fear and insecurity, proposals that I will admit will probably appear to be modest at best, considering the task at hand. Many in my field of international relations focus on the question of why states go to war, why the system itself is based on war. Kenneth Waltz, one of the great international relations uh, scholars, lays out three levels of analysis, the system, the state, and the individual, or in his own terminology, man, the state, and war. His work focuses on the system, and mo many, most of my colleagues seem to focus on the state. I'm going to focus on the individual, something that international relations theory spends far too little time on. But rather than focus on individuals as heads of state, the one area where IR theory tends to be rather strong, my talk takes its cue from Howard Zinn's people's history approach and applies it to contemporary world politics. Carl Sandburg's poem, The Little Girl Who Saw Her First Troop Parade, asks the question, do you know I know something? Sometime they'll give a war and nobody will come. This poem gave rise to the 1960s slogan, what if we threw a war and nobody came? Now every moral and philosophical system has some variant of that four word declarative that we find in the Judeo-Christian Bible, thou shalt not kill. So why is there so much killing in the world? Now, there's an impressive scholarship on issues like the dehumanization of others. And this dehumanization enables killing. When you propagandize about the others as subhuman, and you use racist iconography depicting the enemy as something less than human, it serves as a powerful tool to enable this killing. But even if the enemy is subhuman, there's no inherent right to kill. We don't have the inherent right to kill animals, for instance. Dehumanization enables rather than compels killing. It's fear that compels it. This is because in most philosophical traditions, you have the right to kill, to relax that forward declarative, if your own life or the life of your loved ones are in danger. As Billy Bragg just sung, in wartime, it's time to kill or be killed. Now this is a basic human needs approach to human security, and it's most eloquently addressed in Franklin Roosevelt's famous 1941 speech to Congress. He lays out in this speech the four freedoms, and it's the president's vision for a peaceful world, and what makes it striking is its explicit reference to fear and insecurity. 
Alongside his traditional freedoms of speech and religion, Roosevelt adds the need to preserve the freedom from want and the freedom from fear. The basic human needs approach with its inclusion of the physical and emotional needs of individuals who would fight and support the wars addresses the true core cause of war. Now consider what's typically cited as the most basic of human needs, food, water, shelter, and security. The first three, which would all fall under Roosevelt's basket of freedom from want, have compelled states and individuals to fight war. But all three of these are tangible and measurable. Average, uh, the amount of average daily calories, access to potable drinking water, and the percentage of the population that's homeless are all measurable. Security is unique and that it is completely perceptual. A person can be utter, in utter peril and unaware of the danger he or she faces. And that same person can walk down a safe street in abject fear of consequences, despite any lack of threat. As such, fear and insecurity may be manipulated by both scrupulous and unscrupulous political actors and can drive populations to war or call them to peace. Fear is such a powerful motivator because it is just so easily manipulated. It is easy to scare people. And when those manipulations take the form of racism, this combination provides the sort of combustible mix that has marked human history with horrific atrocity. The use of race as a means to compel armies to kill is nothing new. The racist typically dehumanizes the enemy with the use of language and removes the moral agency both from the soldier and the person he is killing. The most damning aspect of racism is, is its inclusion of an entire population, regardless of ideology, history, personal motivation, or any other factor. Simply being a member of the race is enough to convict, often to a death sentence. But racism alone is not enough to compel violence. The racial descriptions of the other as subhuman are not enough to compel people to kill. It requires fear mixed with racism. Nowhere is this combustible mix of fear and racism more apparent than in the commissions of genocides. Genocides require war. They take place during war. War first provides cover the fog of war. This makes it easier for those who would commit atrocities to hide what they're actually doing. How many uh, campaigns of extreme violence take place literally under our noses without us realizing until after the fact that the killing has taken place. And so international actors frequently find interventions to stop genocides problematic simply because of a lack of good intelligence of what's going on in the field or in another popular parlance. Who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? But genocides also require a certain internal logic of violence. That it's time to kill or be killed enables the perpetrators to commit this horrific act without moral consequence. They're killing to protect themselves, their family, their home, their nation. For instance, the killing in Rwanda coupled the racial imagery of Tutsi as cockroaches with descriptions that they, were, that they were murderers seeking to invade the country. It took place in the context of a civil war, one that would result in a Tutsi victory that actually ended the genocide. German anti-Semitism that led to the horrific, perhaps unprecedented atrocity of the Holocaust took place under the, uh, in the context that Jews were stabbing Germans in the back would compel that nation to lose its country if allowed to continue to exist. 